This podcast is made possible by the kind contributions of listeners. Through Patreon, supporters of the show make a small monthly donation. A dollar or two, it's up to you. And these soon add up. My next goal on Patreon is to hit $250 a month. If we can achieve that, I'll increase my hosting package, allowing me to upload more each month. We may get longer podcasts, certainly. I won't have to worry about the length of each episode. So, to help me make the show better, go to patreon.com slash ww2podcast and become a patron. Not only will you be supporting the show, but I release a few extras that have been left on the cutting room floor for supporters. That's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Hello and welcome, I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're looking at the plight of those Jews fleeing Poland who headed east into Russia after the German invasion in 1939. It's a story that I wasn't at all familiar with. I'm joined by Annette liebeskin Berkowitz. Annette's father, Nachman, fled the Polish city of Łódź. He had a long and incredible life. She tells his story in the most remarkable book I think I've read in a long time. In the unlikeliest of places. Thank you for joining me, Annette. Um, your father is born in uh, Poland. How was Poland for a small Jewish boy growing up pre-war? My father's family came from a rather small uh, village called Przedbush, which is close to central Poland. By the time my father was born, the family moved from the village to the city of Łódź which is the second largest city in Poland. It's uh, right in the center, smack in the center of the country. It was and it continues to be uh, the most industrial city in Poland. As a matter of fact, it had acquired the nickname of the Polish Manchester because there were so many smokestacks and chimneys from all the factories. When the family came to Łódź, they settled uh, in, in, the, in the poor section of town. My grandfather was a carpenter. After a while, he wasn't well enough to do carpentry. So they had a tiny, I mean, really minuscule grocery shop. Uh, from my father's stories, I couldn't quite imagine how small the store was until I took a trip back to Poland with my father and he showed me the building where he lived and and the spot where the little grocery was. And it was truly just a little hole in the wall. My father was educated in the first Yiddish language school in the city because his older brothers, he was the youngest in a family of five, and his older brothers prevailed on his parents, who were religious Jews, to send him to this secular school. And how did that happen? Initially, the parents were not very enthusiastic about it. But the biggest inducement in the decision to send little Nachman to this uh, school was that the school was free and they were poor. They also liked the fact that Yiddish was the primary language in the school. But the Jewish Labor Bund, which became very prominent as a political party in Poland, which fought for workers' rights, was something that was attractive to my father's older brothers. And because of the number of factories and, and the heavy industrial base, there was uh, an enormous exploitation uh, of the workers. The working hours were anywhere from 12 to 14 hours, and the pay was minimal. So the, the Jewish labor bund was very active, and there, were, there was a lot of uh, strife in the city. There were battles with the police. The government was very repressive and, and very fearful of the activities of the socialists. So it was a very fraught time to be growing up. But my father went to that school, and that school really was run uh, like a family. It, it, it's really incredible. I, I will give you one example that will show you how far the, the love and camaraderie among the teachers and the students went. When my father arrived in America, at the age of almost 50, 
his friends from the first grade who ended up in America, a few of them, took him in. They helped him secure a job and they cared for him as you would for the closest relative. So that school was just a wonderful experience for my father. As a matter of fact, when uh, we threw my father a big 90th birthday party in Israel, two of his elementary school friends who were still alive traveled uh, from the U.S. for his birthday because the closeness among the students and the teachers in that school was, was quite remarkable. Nothing like schools we have today. Am I right in saying uh, I got the impression that so Poland was, uh, there, there was an anti-Semitic streak in Poland. I wonder if that helped galvanize them all together. Uh, yes, uh, yes, that's true. Uh, how shall I put it? There was a lot of anti-Semitism in, in Poland, but especially in those years, the, when we're talking about uh, my father uh, getting into his teenage years, the anti-Semitism uh, accelerated greatly. And of course, uh, then we're talking from, from the early 30s, uh, given the political events in Germany, the anti-Semitism increased in Poland very, very substantially, which is the reason why Jewish young men tried to avoid service in the Polish military at all costs. That was going to be my next question. He was keen to be cut to, to his military service. Well, the, you know, the interesting thing about the book, uh, when you look at the cover, you see a young man in a military uniform. First of all, just to make it clear to your listeners, it has nothing to do with the war. This is not a picture of him in military uniform during wartime. What is unusual about the picture is that if you really looked at it very closely, in the lower right-hand corner is his signature in Yiddish. And I think you would not find many photos of Jewish soldiers in Polish uniforms with their signature prominently in Yiddish. He was always very proud of his Jewish heritage, and he put it there openly. As you read in the book, his experiences in the military were quite unusual. One of the reasons that he wanted to serve in the military and the rest of his friends and family thought it was crazy was a, he wanted to show that Jewish uh, men uh, aren't meek. In fact, he became a top marksman in the military. <clears throat> but he also had that incredible desire to play an instrument. And he was hoping that <clears throat> by some luck, he would get to play in the military band. Right from the start, he became the company bugler. It, it's a very obtuse way to... Uh... To learn an instrument to join the military. <laughs> Absolutely. But he was so poor, he couldn't dream of having an instrument. Your father joined the Jewish Labour Bund, didn't he? Which which led to his him, him being arrested, which um, I wonder if you could tell me about that, because that's his first stint in prison. When my father was still a young man, he became very politically aware and he joined the Jewish Labour Bund. One day he attended a rally uh, that had to do with lowering the number of working hours. Uh, and it was a rally that was sponsored by the Polish Socialist Party and the German Socialist Party. And here I would make a little footnote that the population of the city of Łódź at that time was uh, split roughly 30% or so Poles, Germans, and Jews. So And all the socialist parties worked together very closely. So he went to this rally, and the rally ended up being a extremely rough event because the police stormed the stage, arrested the speakers, and began arresting the, some of the participants. So people tried to get out of there as soon as they could. My father left, and... Um, he was pushed into one of those uh, dark Polish gates uh, by uh, the, the secret police. As I said, uh, the government uh, was uh, very right-wing, very concerned about any political activity that might destabilize it. So they had police follow him and plant communist literature on him 
he tried to explain that as a Bundist he couldn't possibly be communist because especially at that period, the socialists and the communists were at great odds politically. They didn't agree on anything. There was incredible hatred between them. Uh, so my father thought he would explain that uh, if he was a Bundist, that it would be obvious to anybody with half a brain that he couldn't possibly be a communist. But there was no talking to these people. They handcuffed him. They threw him into a police van. They brought him to a prison. There ensued a period of incarceration that was extremely traumatic. He had just turned 20. He was a young man. He was thrown in a cell with about two dozen men who were co who were communists, most of whom were communists. Uh, some were Poles, some were Jews. It was, it was a mix of people there. And there were constant interrogations, constant beatings. And uh, outside the window, they could see um, the place where they hung people. So it was always uh, in their mind that that they could lose their lives there. It, it was it was a very, very rough experience. In fact, many years later in the 80s, my husband and I took a trip back to Poland and uh, to my great surprise, the building that was a prison is still in existence. It has been turned into uh, a museum called the Museum of Independence Traditions. And the director there took me on a tour and showed me a sample of the kind of cell he would have been in. It was terrifying to see because the size was so small, and to think that more than two dozen men uh, were there, there, there was literally no room to lie down. They had to lie like herring, head to foot. Uh, there was no air to breathe. The, the physical punishments were incredible. There, there was no, no way to know whether his family and friends knew what had happened to him. Eventually, he found out the two very famous uh, jurists named Ehrlich and Alter. They took his case pro bono because they said, well, it, it wasn't possible for a Bundist to distribute communist literature. And eventually, after uh, seven or eight months, I would have to look up the specific period, they got him off. Uh, there was a there was a huge trial in a brand new courthouse. It, it was covered extensively by the press because it was the first trial in a brand new courthouse. And my father was released. And and one might have thought that after having such a bad experience um, uh, brought on your head by the government, that that he he would not have wanted to serve in the military. But quite the opposite. He became more determined than ever that he will serve and that he will show the patriotism uh, of, of Jewish citizens to the country. I think you say in the book he called that time he's uh, in prison his college education. He called it his education because he, he got along with other prisoners. He always said to me, I said, you know, how did you manage, you know, with all these communists around you? And he said, you know, they were human beings. They are political uh, Ideas didn't uh, comport with mine, but but we were we were human beings in the same predicament, and he got along with everyone. It was just the kind of personality he had. He could get along with anybody. In 1939, uh, you know, Germany invades. Uh, presumably, there's some sort of call up, um, but he, he doesn't quite manage to get or join the army or rejoin the army or I quite know how to put it if that if that makes sense. He makes an attempt, though, doesn't he? On September 1st, 1939, the German army invaded Poland. And at that time, the Polish president, his name was Moszczycki, he issued a call on the radio to all able-bodied men to march towards Warsaw to defend the capital. So my father described in... in quite a high level of detail how he and his friends and his brothers along with hundreds and thousands of their neighbors and people on every block started streaming walking there was no other way to get there they had to walk towards warsaw about i think 100 kilometers it, it was it was not an easy 
trek to make, but they responded to the president's call to defend their capital. And as they started walking, when large numbers of them were amassed, the German planes came overhead and started strafing and killing people at such close range. It was it was brutal. They marched uh, and they were shot again and they marched again and they marched again and they came uh, across villages that were burning. Many of them were Jewish villages. There were other villages too. The, it seemed like everything they pass was on fire and at a certain point they were they were close to Warsaw but not quite at Warsaw there was a line of uh, German soldiers who it, it became very clear that Warsaw had already been taken and that in fact the, the government left and the Polish government uh, went uh, to, to function in, in, in absentia in London all the people that had come to defend the capital, were turned back by the Germans. And on the way back, they were ordered by the Germans to clean up the dead bodies, the dead horses. And that field of death that my father saw was one of the main factors that convinced him that in the Second World War, the German soldiers would not behave uh, the way they did in World War I. They wouldn't be mere soldiers. He said they would. They had turned into beasts. That was his sense right from the start. Uh, he re- he returns to uh, uh, w- w- Woods. Uh, yes, he, yes, he did. He returned to Woods. He, he was uh, he shared an apartment with his sister after their mother passed away, and his sister worked for a Jewish social service agency, and she described to him, as soon as he came back from that terrible march, an incident uh, when uh, where an Orthodox Jewish man with a big beard came to, to the agency to conduct some business, and the German uh, uh, soldiers dragged him down the stairs, brought him into the street, and shoved him into the sewer, to the horror of uh, other pedestrians on the street, and how they laughed, and, and she was telling him how the laughter reverberated in her ears, and how horrified everyone was. And when she told him that story, and he remembered what he saw on the march towards Warsaw and on the way back, he made up his mind right then and there, it's time to get out. And he made up his mind to convince his family members that things are going to be very different than they were in World War I. And he worked so hard. He tried to convince his brothers, his sisters, but no one would listen to him. And they said it was insanity to try and get across the border. The eastern border of Poland was at the River Bug. At that point, the, the, the Nazis had already occupied the western side of the river, and the uh, eastern side of the river was occupied by the Soviets. So uh, people said, it's, it's certain death. You, you dare not cross the river because you will be killed. My father decided to risk it. And interestingly, there's been... Not so much research on this, and I, I'll, I want to talk to you about this in a moment, but what I want to say is that it wasn't until recently that I came across a very interesting statistics. Professor Timothy Snyder, he's one of the leading scholars on the Holocaust, uh, cited a figure in his last book that in the fall of 1939, which is exactly the time when my father crossed the river in November, 50,000 Polish citizens were killed by the German security forces and soldiers uh, in in trying to undertake the passage, which explains to me now why everybody thought it was crazy to try and cross. Thousands of people were getting killed just crossing the border with the river. But my father decided to do it. He was fortunate he managed to cross the river and get into the Soviet Union. It was a brave decision because no doubt you know, the Russians, <laughs> the Russians didn't necessarily want, were not known for uh, uh, necessarily embracing 
communist Russia, Soviet Russia was not known necessarily for embracing foreigners, uh, were very suspicious as well. I, I'd not, I wasn't aware that so many had, had fled in that direction. How did he find Russian-occupied uh, Poland once he'd, once he'd uh, crossed the bug? He crossed the river at night, of course. So he was uh, told by the farmer who ferried him across the river to follow the train tracks. He walked through the forest. It was dark. It was scary. But as he started to emerge from the forest, he always told me this was the most surreal feeling he heard singing, and he was thinking, singing? You know, he had just escaped from a country at war, and he couldn't understand why you're singing. As he came closer, the singing was in Yiddish. And he realized that there was a, a substantial number of, of, of Jews in that town who, who were celebrating, and things were still... Uh, fine and happy on that occupied uh, of the side of the Poland that had been occupied by the Soviets. The, the war still hadn't arrived there. And, and there were all kinds of rumors circulating. If you go here, you will be able to get out. If you go to Vilna, you might be able to get a visa to go to Brazil, or you might even get a visa to go to America. So a lot of people tried to make their way towards Vilna, which is Vilnius now. At a certain point, the, the Soviet military closed uh, the passage, and you couldn't, you couldn't get out. Uh, there was no uh, more opportunity to, to, to leave the, the Soviet Union and get a visa to go elsewhere. What happened subsequently to my father was, was kind of a... You can almost call it a fortunate accident of history, but for many it was not fortunate. It was, happened to be fortunate for my father. A and here is what unfolded. The part of Soviet Union uh, from which my father was deported to a gulag shortly after the Germans uh, came in, there was um, hundreds of thousands of killings in, in all those villages, uh, uh, but what the what the Soviet authorities did at the time is they called in all the Polish citizens to come and register, and they offered them Soviet citizenship. I can't imagine that any of them, certainly not my father, agreed to accept Soviet citizenship. First of all, they didn't know how long the war would last. They didn't know when they would be going back home. Of course they wanted to go back to Poland. They were Polish citizens. So they said no, thank you to uh, the offer of Soviet citizenship. The authorities that called them into these offices to register said fine, that's okay. And they let them go. But now they had the address. And of course, uh, over the next few days, the next night, they came with soldiers, with dogs. They arrested everybody who declined Soviet citizenship. First, they put them on trains and, and cattle cars, and they didn't tell them where they were going. They had no idea. And my father kept trying to intuit, what, what, what are they doing with us? Where are we going? And he was thinking, well, they're probably not going to kill us because they could have killed us now. They didn't need to put us on a train. After days and days on the train, they arrived at the river Volga and there were boats waiting for them. My father was completely flabbergasted. Boats? Where, where are we going? Obviously not going on any kind of vacation. And they ended up taking them to some of the most remote northern reaches of the Soviet Union, in my father's case, he went to a brand new gulag. It was called Opalicha. It was north of the city of Yaroslav. That's where he saw, okay, I'm in prison again. He saw the guard towers, uh, the barbed wire all, all around. There, he was captured. He was imprisoned in the gulag for slave labor. When he becomes a camp a camp leader? A, a sort of a, uh... Yes, he had something very unusual happen to him. When they brought all these men, there were 600 men in this gulag. The first night they arrived, 
they put them all in barracks that were very poorly constructed, uh, rough-hewn wood, spaces in the boards that formed the barracks. It was cold. And one of the leaders on the ground came in and said, I need somebody to volunteer to make a list of names of all these men. Of course, everybody was quiet. Everybody knew that if you open your mouth in the Soviet Union, you're in big trouble. So no, nobody spoke out. And my father thought to himself, well, if no one volunteers, we might be punished. Uh, something, something, uh, something bad is going to happen. So my father always had incredibly beautiful handwriting, and he had gotten a lot of praise for his handwriting. So he thought, well, a good handwriting, maybe I should volunteer. So he raised his hand. He gave him a piece of paper and a pencil. He went around. He got everybody's name. He wrote down the names. He realized on the names that all these men were Jewish. Okay, he made the list. He turned it in. That was it. They went to sleep. Next morning, uh, something like 5 a.m., they called them out to muster. They bring everybody out. They marched them out of the campgrounds. And, and, and every, they don't explain anything. Nobody knows why they are there, what they are going to be doing. They bring them out into a, a huge field where, where gigantic uh, forests were felled. And they had to uh, pick up the logs, pick up construction equipment, uh, do really heavy-duty labor, which none of these uh, people were equipped for. They had no clothing there. They had no materials to work with. They, they work for a while. They don't know how long they're going to be there. Suddenly, a Soviet uh, man of authority shows up. My father knew he was a man of authority because he wore a, a, a long leather coat with epaulets. He calls out his name. He says, Liebeskind. Who is Liebeskind? And my father is like, oh, he says, now I'm in trouble. They call your name in the Soviet Union, bad news. He's immediately thinking, it's probably because I volunteered to write that list. So, so the Soviet uh, military a man calls him over, says, points to a, a, a rock over there next to a tree. He says, sit down here with me. We're going to have a little talk. Oh, my father, was he was so nervous. It was, uh, this was not good. And he started interviewing him. He asked him a lot of questions about his education. When he heard that my father went to a socialist school, I think that probably appealed to him. He said, do you come from a rich family? My father says, no, because he didn't. <laughs> oh, they like that. Okay. He came from a poor family. He went to a socialist school. The soldier gave him a slap on the back. He said, you come with me. And he brought him back onto the site of the campground, the labor camp, and he brought him into the office. And uh, they proceeded to explain to, uh, to my father that um, the 600 men that were arrested would be split into two groups of 300 and that each one would have a, a man responsible for the group. So my father became one of the men responsible for 300 prisoners. And his responsibility mainly uh, required him to make sure that all the workshops, because they created workshops for, for painters, for tailors, for shoemakers, uh, so, so that the community could, could sustain itself. And he had to make sure that all of these, that the, the kitchen and the laundry and that all of these services worked and that in the morning, every single man had to show up for muster. Now, many of these people, uh, some were old, some were sick. They, they couldn't come out, and they would hide. They would hide on the grounds of the camp, or they would hide in the, un, under the bunks and in the latrines. My father never looked for them. He never chased them out. 
he managed to protect as many of the men as possible. And he never, ever used his position. He was very proud of that to to make his fate there better because the starvation there was rampant. And he probably could have asked the kitchen uh, for extra food for himself, but he never did. And, and, and as evidence of that is that years later when he left uh, the camp, when we, when we came to Israel, there were some uh, guys who had been in that same um, gulag and they wanted to, to give him money. They wanted to help us. They wanted to do all kinds of things. My father said, you know, I, I did what every decent human being should do. I don't want to be rewarded for it in any way. But one of them ended up eventually in America. And when we were in Poland, he sent us packages of toys for my brother and me from Macy's. We would get packages regularly because uh, he just didn't know what he could do to thank my father for uh, helping him survive, getting him shoes. Uh, there was a guy my father got out of the brig. He did whatever he could. That must have been very thrilling as a child, receiving uh, packages from America. Oh, yes. I still remember <laughs> M-A-C-Y-S. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, have been, I'd have been over the moon. Just your know, foreign postcard was highly excited with a different stamp on. <laughs> what a whole package. <gasps> oh. How long did the Russians keep them? Keep him. He was in the camp for over a year. I think it was close to a year and a half. But then uh, the Polish government uh, in exile in London made an agreement with uh, Stalin to let out the Polish prisoners. Uh, and there was the expectation uh, that the Polish prisoners would join the Soviet army to fight uh, uh, the Germans as they were approaching closer and closer within the Soviet Union. Based on research I did, they didn't release the all the, I think, 200,000 or, or more, close to 300,000 uh, people that they imprisoned. Uh, they released uh, closer to 100,000. My father always described that when he was let out of uh, this uh, gulag, all he wanted to do is to warm up because they were so far north where the winter temperatures were uh, below 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, it, wa it was incredibly cold and they had no clothing. They had so many men died of uh, disease because they had no food and no medicines. The cold and the starvation were, were the two worst things, in addition to the lice and the vermin that was all over their bodies. But they wanted to go to a warm place. That was their biggest thing, to go someplace where it was warm. So they went south as far as they could. They traveled by everything that they could get on uh a horse and carriage, they would uh, give a few kopecks to a farmer to take them here. They would get on a train, the train would go in their direction for a while, then they would stop, you would have to change it. It took weeks and weeks, but finally they got to the foothills of the Himalayas. They couldn't cross the Himalayas, so that's where my father remained, and that's where he met my mother, who was released from a gulag in Siberia, and her conditions were possibly even more harsh than his. She was from Warsaw. She escaped uh, in a similar manner to your father across across the bug. I believe that's how she got across. I, I can't imagine any other way. But the interesting thing about my mother was that she didn't talk about it. My father had this almost uh, like a missionary zeal for telling the story. And, and, and what I found recently is that uh, historians are now writing of the hierarchy of suffering, meaning that immediately after the war, the people who survived in the Soviet Union, even though it was a small number, and even though they suffered starvation, disease, and thousands died, they didn't talk about it because when they discovered what had happened in the concentration camps in Poland, they considered their suffering to be lesser and not to be spoken of. So they didn't talk about it. My father was one of a tiny minority that did. 
what what were they doing for money in uh it's, Kyr- it's Kyrgyzstan. They 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 ended up. What were they doing for money? One would assume that the Russians had sort of put them to work in factories and fields for war work. They put them to work. My father had a job in a brick making factory. He was um, kind of a manager in the brick making factory, and if you were working uh, for them, they they gave you housing. It was one room, but it was it was housing, and I I was. A very small girl, but I remember it. I remember uh, living in that uh, compound where my mother and I would walk to my father's office and he would sit uh, at a desk below uh, a row of photographs of all of the Soviet Politburo. And and since I had no toys, I had nothing. You know, my father used the, the pictures of the members of the Politburo as, as a as a toy for me, he would teach me their names and, you know, he would ask me if I remember them. <laughs> That's my, was there a little enclave of uh, Jewish refugees uh, where you were growing up? Yes. In the Soviet Union, round where you were growing up, I didn't know if they uh, um, had sort of drawn themselves together, you know, as often as people do, don't they? Yes, they did. Y- yes, they did. And it actually it created a big problem because the people that were drawn together, uh, a, a substantial number of them were Bundists. At that point, the government was very concerned about opposition from any other parties. My father was under observation by the NKVD, the, the secret police. He would be hauled in for interrogations periodically, you know, they, they threatened to separate him from the family and so on. They, they wanted him to inform on the other members of the community, and he refused, so they, they tortured him because, uh, you know, he, he was saying, I, I want to know what, what, what you talk about when you get together. And they threatened him when he went to Poland because, you know, they knew that they were going to exercise uh, their control over Poland. So they threatened him. They said, we'll keep an eye on you when you get to Poland. Don't don't think you have gotten away. And they did. did. Did your parents always expect to return to Poland? Oh, yes, of course. They left large families in Poland. And, and all they wanted to do is get to Poland and find them. They were so remote in that village uh, in Kyrgyzstan, that they heard rumors about the slaughter in Poland, but but people didn't believe it. My father often told me how people said, oh, that's ridiculous, that that can't happen, and, you know, things like that don't happen. They didn't really believe the extent of, of of the murder in Poland. And, of course, everybody who came from Poland wanted to go back, find their home, their family, but, uh, of course, nobody was left. You see, once once my parents uh, made their way back to Poland in the May of 1946, my brother was born the day after we arrived. As you probably read, he was born in a homeless sh- shelter and he was ill. It's incredible that they undertook that journey with your mother so heavily pregnant. <laughs> yes, yes, because, uh, you know, they, they were worried that they wouldn't be able to get out later and they probably wouldn't have been. They probably made it out just in time, but my brother was born, he was sick, he, he was born with an infection, there was no doctors, they were in a homeless shelter. And if it weren't for one of my father's school friends from that school that I mentioned to you, where he went when he was a young boy, who he met on the street and said, come, we have a place you can live with us. Well, the, the, that, that place was a one-room apartment. And they took my father, my mother, uh, me, a three-year-old, and, and a screaming newborn infant. They were incredible people. And they worked, uh, and they, you know, they, they fed us. And my father's friend, uh, Yannick, uh, loaned my father a jacket so he could go and try apply for jobs. And they were a childless family. They, they ended up emigrating eventually to Canada. Your father did get a letter from his sister, though, when you, just before they uh, you left Kyrgyzstan, didn't he? Incredible that it, it could find him. It turns out that the mail that came... I actually am in possession of uh, postcards that came uh, from both the Warsaw Ghetto and from the Lodge Ghetto. 
Most of them are written in German. The inmates of the ghetto were required to write in German, and they have the German censor stamp on it. And they had to say, everything is fine, we are living well, everything is good. Now, my father didn't get those postcards until after the war. They, they were being kept by the Soviet postal authorities, but he eventually did get a whole package of these things, where these pe the people who had written them were long dead by then. Also, along with that package of letters, my father got a letter from his sister, his one sister, one of his two sisters, survived Auschwitz. She lost a child and a husband, uh, but she survived, and she wrote that dramatic letter to my father, enumerating how each of the members of his family had died. She ended up in a German displaced persons camp, and eventually she met another Holocaust survivor there, and they emigrated to the United States, and they were married, and she formed a new family here in the U.S., but she never told her daughters from the second husband what had happened to her. It wasn't until I let the word slip because I didn't know that my cousin didn't know this. And uh, she, she was a, a grown woman and her mother was long dead when she found out her mother's history. It was a very traumatic experience for my cousin. They'd heard nothing from home during the war. What, what, what did they find when they returned? Was What was the pop Jewish population like in uh, just after the war? Initially, it was it was it was minuscule, of course, because uh, ninety nine percent of the population, which uh, Jewish population, was wiped out. Uh, but then you had people coming in, uh, the survivors from the Soviet Union coming in, searching for family. So it was it was bedlam. People coming and going and looking for relatives, trying to go to their homes where other people had occupied their homes so they had nowhere to live. It was, uh, it was a bitter time. It was a very bitter time. And unemployment was extremely high. It was right after the war. The interesting thing, though, I have to add a postscript here about the city of Woods. Since uh, the Germans uh, made it uh, Woj their headquarters, they renamed the city as Litzmannstadt, uh, it wasn't destroyed. Warsaw was totally crushed to powder. There was nothing left in Warsaw. But not that, that was not the case with Woj. The buildings were completely intact. Uh, but the unemployment was great after the war, and, and how my father ended up getting his job was, you remember I talked about him in the prison way back many years prior when he was 20 years old. He had befriended one of the communist cellmates. And now, of course, in Poland, communism was in its ascendancy. And his uh, communist friend became uh, uh, the head of personnel in this largest textile concern in Poland. And when my father uh, stood on line, the line uh, went on for blocks and blocks, and people would get numbers because they never made it to the front door in one day. They would get a number so they could come back the next day and continue standing in line. One day as he was standing in line, a tall man with black hair came, a big heavy set man, put his arm around his shoulder and he said, Come with me. And my father was like, who is this person? He says, Nachman, you don't recognize me? My father was stunned. It was his friend, Antoni, from prison. And he pulled him out of line. And he brought him inside into the building. And he ended up giving him a very good position. My father ended up being a director of one of the major departments there. And uh, he had a very prestigious position in Poland. He didn't make a lot of money, but he had a lot of uh, prestige. He had secretaries. He had uh, sh a chauffeur-driven vehicle. Uh, we, we did economically, we did fine in Poland. But of course, uh, my parents were, were desperate to leave because of the anti-Semitism after the war was even worse than before the war. <laughs> 
I was surprised to hear that. I was surprised that your father wasn't allowed to register um, his, uh, his son's name as David. And it was incredible. It it wasn't clear to me whether the official who registered the birth didn't want the name of David because maybe perhaps she thought she was being helpful to not register a child with such an overtly Jewish name or whether she was an anti-Semite and just refused to do that. It, it, it was hard to know what the motivation was. But of course, I do know the motivation when my father was told at one point in his career, uh, you won't get a promotion unless you change your name because Liebeskind is just too Jewish sounding. We, we can't have that. The family eventually emigrates to Israel. I mean, how hard is it to achieve? Because this is in the cold. I hadn't realized, you know, that such a dull an escape route, an escape route. You know, it was it was easy to get out of. Uh, you know, the Iron Curtain had fallen. How did they get? How did they get out out of uh, Poland to Israel? The entire ten years that we lived in Poland, my parents wanted to leave. But of course, you couldn't leave. People, people these days don't realize you couldn't just pack your bag, buy a ticket, and get out. You needed permission from the government. You needed something called an exit visa. So periodically, primarily, I think, as a harassment tactic for the Jews, uh, the government would issue an exit visa, and just as you were ready to leave, you would pack your belongings, you had given up your job they would say, uh, sorry, the exit visa is revoked. So you had to start from scratch. And my parents tried uh, four or five times. And and when the opportunity arose in 1957, there was a brief uh, political thaw. They did it so quickly, like overnight, these gigantic crates appeared in our living room and in and, and, and Woj. And all the possessions were thrown in, and we were ready to go. I mean, it, it happened so quickly. It was, it was really uh, a shock, to, certainly to my system, because we, we came to Israel. We, we didn't speak any Hebrew. Uh, and if you know anything about Slavic languages, Polish and Hebrew have nothing in common. They're very different. Uh, it's very difficult for a Polish speaker to learn Hebrew. Not only are the words different, but the, but the alphabet is different. So uh, it was it, it was difficult. And of course, as I said, economically we we did quite uh, all right in Poland. But in Israel, uh, once again, we we had no place to live. Fortunately, my mother had sisters uh, and brothers. She came from a very large family that had emigrated uh, way before World War II, and they were in Israel. You know, they, they helped us some initially, but my father couldn't get a job because he didn't speak Hebrew. He didn't speak the language. And, and, and one of the most aggravating things for him was that in those years, the Yiddish language, which was my father's mother tongue, his primary language, was not welcome in Israel. Every time he opened his mouth and wanted to say something in Yiddish, people would say, don't speak that language. You were supposed to speak Hebrew only. And that, that was very upsetting to him because speaking Yiddish in Poland was not uh, something you could do in, in, in anti-Semitic communist Poland. Uh, so my parents only spoke Yiddish at home, but you couldn't speak it outside. My father looked forward to speaking Yiddish in Israel, and uh, very quickly he discovered that he couldn't. And of course, in addition to that, he couldn't get a job because he was over 40. And it was a very young country. Keep in mind, when we arrived, the country was only 10 years old. Uh, and... Um, they wanted young people to build a country. You were over 40 or over the hill. So he's nearly 50 when he, when he emigrates to the US. Um, and I, he's not only nearly 50, he can't speak English. It was, it was a very brave undertaking, you know. Um, I was upset at having to leave Israel and move to yet another country when I was a teenager. But looking back on it as an adult woman, I'm thinking... You know, leaving everything behind and going to a new country with new customs and new language uh, 
when you're 50 is a very difficult thing to do. My father insisted, both my parents actually, on learning English. They went to night school uh, to study. They felt very strongly you need to speak the language of the country so you could participate as a citizen, to read the newspapers. And my mother wanted to write a book in English. Your father did return to Poland many years later. Um, how did he feel about it? Did he find many people that he once knew? He really wanted to go back to Poland. A, a lot of uh, Jews, uh, uh, of the Jews who survived, never wanted to see Poland again. They would say time and again, my mother used to say it, the Polish soil is soaked with Jewish blood. Didn't want to go. My father didn't have that feeling. My father was able to sort of focus on the future and to say, uh, it's a new chapter, uh, you, you know, I'm not going to look back. And he really wanted to go badly to Poland. My mother wouldn't go with him. But after she passed away, I went with him. And the first thing he did, I'll never forget this. We, he was still wearing his coat. We walked into the hotel room. He sat the suitcase down and he went straight to the phone. To, uh, the first to the phone book, then to the phone. And I, I was thinking like, Dad, take your coat off. And and he was, you know who he was calling? He was calling his friend Antoni, the guy I told you that I gave him the job in Poland. When he dialed the phone, somebody answered, and he identified himself, and the man said, oh, I'm so sorry, he's not alive any longer. So my father asked to speak to Claudia, his wife, and he said, oh, she passed away a few moments ago. And I saw my father was so upset. He was so beside himself, he was silent for a few minutes, and then he was dialing the phone again. And I was thinking, who could he be calling now? And he ended up calling uh, a woman who was at the time when he worked in that uh, department in, in, in Poland. She was his boss. She was a very young woman. Of course, by the time we came back to Poland, she was no longer a young woman. But she answered the phone and she recognized my father's voice instantly. She was a Polish woman. She said, Nachman. And she said, stay where you are, don't go anywhere. And uh, she was one of the few people who had a car at that time in Poland. Very few people owned uh, private vehicles. And she and her husband, maybe half an hour later, showed up at our hotel door. She had a giant bouquet of roses. And she she was so happy to see my father. It was It was really very heartwarming. And he said to me afterwards, you see... You can't say the same thing about all the Polish people. And, and he was right. Uh, your brother was the architect for the Jewish uh, Museum in Berlin, and your father was there f for the opening. How did he feel about that? What did he think? Oh, my father was, my father was thrilled to be there. There, there again, you know, his uh, visit to Germany, uh, it, it was a similar attitude as the attitude about going back to Poland. Uh, you will still find uh, many Jewish people who will say, I will never set foot on German soil. My father said, Berlin, sure, I'm going. Uh, he, he had no qualms about it. He was the only one in our family who was not horrified that my brother moved with his young family to Berlin. Uh, my, my father's uh, grandsons, his daughter, his granddaughter wasn't born yet, but his two grandsons were young boys when my brother and his wife moved to Berlin because they knew if they didn't live there and participate in, in, in the arcane politics that the museum would never get built. So uh, they moved uh, to Berlin and uh, other relatives said, it's it's unbelievable. It, it's horrible that he moved his family, his boys growing up in Berlin. But my father had no problem with it. And he went to the opening and uh, he, he was very proud to be there. And uh, he was saying, you know, the, 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 the people that, that killed us, that didn't want us here, their bones are rot rotting in the ground and I'm here. And, uh, you know, he, he said in Yiddish, Ich bin du, I am here. And that's 
and that said everything. He was he was a remarkable man. As I said, the, the book just fills you. Uh, it, it's the end of it's it, it's after the war. After he's been through you know all those arrests, and he's just such a hopeful, optimistic view of life. Is how you portray him, and it's wonderful. Yes, he he was like that. He he was optimistic. He loved people. He had such belief and in humanity and the goodness of people. And my father always had that philosophy uh, of optimism. And he always also said, it's never too late to do the things that you want to do. That's why he started painting at the age of 72 and was such a successful artist. And, and I want people to, to, to take a lesson from that and, and to be heartened by that. Um, I, you know, the most remarkable thing to me was that at his funeral, he was a man of 92, and very often you go to a funeral of of, a, of an old person who, especially one who has a very, very little family, there's just a handful of people. My father's funeral had well over 100 people. There was, we couldn't fit everybody into the, uh, into the space where we, we held the service. Uh, there were young people hanging out uh, of the room all the way down the stairs. Uh, people from every walk of life. Uh, yeah. Your father was the most remarkable man. Annette's book, In the Unlikeliest of Places, is well worth reading. For all the trials and tribulations her father lived through, the book is full of hope. Her father is the most inspiring man. I'll put a link on the website, www.podcast.com. You can find Annette's website with more details and pictures of her father at AnnetteBerkovitz.com. And again, I'll put a link on the website. That's it for now. Thanks for listening.